walk of this cell. Uh, let's see how it looks. Yeah, it looks okay. This uh, paper um, aims at uh, two things. Please find a chair. This one here. Yeah. It's okay. This paper aims at two things, a detailed presentation of a site-specific work of Herr Rutzig and Van Uffele called Landfall, that's the title of the site-specific work, and subsequently a closely related interpretation in the context of an aesthetics of power that should follow. The focal point of this interpretation is the complex artistic manipulation of the contour of the island of Surtsey. So, I'm not doing deconstruction, I'm trying to understand what the artist do or did. But that's the kind of the, the, the meaning of the word interpretation. Um, island, uh, this island serves a Keurigis, yes. okay. a volcanic island near Iceland. The proposal is, or my proposal is to understand the use of this contour as a critical reuse of a familiar concept in the history of art and aesthetics, namely the frame. Sometimes also simply referred to as window. So at stake are two questions. How could a contour be used and understood as a critical frame? The second question is a little bit broader. How to understand the frame as a key concept, that is, as an operative concept of an aesthetics of power? This is the leaflet. Uh, used for the opening of the exhibition of Landfall. It shows in word and image the two relevant sites of Landfall, namely Sertse and the Zuidas Amsterdam. It is perhaps, I think, convenient to start with a Google Maps strip to have just short, to have a quick look at two relevant, lo two relevant locations. So, where to locate Sertse? Well, it is not far away from Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland. So I zoom in, and here it's the Sertse, and uh, the Zuidas Amsterdam. I return again to this leaflet, and now we go to the Zuidas Amsterdam, a little bit more south from Iceland, and I zoom in and you can have a kind of approximation of what it's, it's about. This is the location, what it's about. The first step is to be able to understand the use of this specific contour, that is to go back to the history of Sertse. I think that's kind of prerequisite to understand what Sertse is. I will just mention a minimum of facts prerequisite for our understanding of Sertse. On November 14, 1963, a volcanic activity has been perceived by the crew of a fishing boat. Four years, four years later, all volcanic activity ceased. By that time, the highest point of the island was 560 feet, so approximately 171 meters, above sea level. Due to corrosion, this point measures nowadays about 150 meters. A few meters more or less do not matter, do not matter much to, for the analogical idea of landfill. Suggested is a specific relation, namely between the architectonic, earthly, oceanic powers of Sertsen and the artistic and architectural tectonic powers in the Zuidas of Saddam. The intended analogy between the two phenomena seems obvious. Nature creates a few years, in a few years an island. The city plans re repeat the power of nature and create, in a few years, a skyscraper of business. A skyscraper of business uh, center, I should say. When we take the context into account, the towers that have been built at Zuidas are exceptionally high, not for a Manhattan standard, but for Amsterdam standard, they're exceptionally high. Zuidas is also an unprecedented building activity in the Netherlands. This eruptive aspect is the most striking resemblance between Surtsey and Zuidas. Although the main buildings at the Zuidas do not measure as high as the highest volcano of Surtsey, so Abbey and Domro, the most important bank in, in Holland, and then the WTC Centre, 
this red building called the symphony, offices and apartments, and then a small secret tower is accountancy. So, in a classical modern terms, both the volcanic, can you read these small letters? I will help you a little bit. In the classical modern terms, both the volcanic and architectonic phenomena are fairly suitable candidates for the Kantian categories of mathematical and dynamical sublime, so like core concepts of these things. For now, I will you, you leave that, uh, that sublime detail, and I will go to the clear suggestion and invitation of landfall, that is to concentrate on the manipulation of the two different maps. The text shows three phases of steps. Three, three different steps or phases. The first one I have already referred to in the Google Maps store. In order to be able to fold effectively one layer on the other, the layers have to be of the same scale. I would call that an act of synchronizing. This act of making the same is indispensable for the projective part. The second step reveals another aspect of the power that is involved, namely the act of superimposition which is probably the very act of frame. The redesigned idea of the frame is thus actualized in the mind as an operative concept. The third step shows how this idea had to be realized in matter, I quote the words, realized in matter, that's what it's about, that is, in an act of recreation. The three steps uh, can be summarized in three words, synchronizing, superimposition and recreation. To give you the feeling of a close contact with the work, I will first focus in detail on the last step, the part of recreation. Landfall was composed at Tarte, site-specific billboards, a few of them installed very close or in the middle of the two craters. The chronology has no other function than numeration and individual orientation. Every single billboard has two sides, a text site and a photo site. The same text is attached on each board. It informs the viewer about the birth of Sunset. This is the map attached to every single billboard. The text says, you are here. Can I go over the cursor there? Yes. Oh, it's not visible here. So, it says, it says, This, this, this indicates, u bent here in Dutch, you are here. So you are, as viewer, located on the position where the billboard is, with this small map. You are here. You are perceiving from this side the volcanic island. So everywhere where these numbers are indicated, it says, you are here. So at the moment, saying, we are more or less here. In the distance, you can see here the billboard from the water side, very appropriate for the first bit work, I would say. Um, we reach it from the land, but and then we see first from the, from the seaside, we see the text side, and then when we turn around, we see this specific crater uh, position. So this is one wall of the lowest crater. Inside the first crater, we look up to the crater wall. The rest of this wall we find after a few minutes walk from here. That's the next billboard. So I go there. It's about five minutes walking in Amsterdam, not in the crater. So here we are. That's the second one. And this one is, as the other one, very close by the port of wall. And that's one main point for my uh, interpretation. It says again, we are here. And from this spot, you can also see the court of wall. So, a side view of the court of wall. The billboard is on the right, and when you are in front of it, you can see it in the distance over there on the right. This is the same building of the court of wall from the front here. And the word on top means court of law, so UCC in Dutch. If you get permission, which I did, you can enter the building to gain some overview. 
So from the top floor of the court of law, you can see the other crater. It seems not that far away, still under construction. At that time, under construction. 2005, seven is quite a heavy, uh, a lot of, lot of activity. And this building under construction is called the one on the right. This one is called the Rock. Kind of a nickname for it. Go. When we go to billboard number three, we can perceive this other crater. We are just approaching it, and we have a view on this uh, on the first crater there too. It's the highest one. We have some view from this side, and after that we go to four. We approach the crater from the back. That is from the shore side. It's really a rectangular, or like, like a sort of skyscraper. So I can make a little dance around the billboard. And you can see this, this aspect of the billboard is also that you have a kind of horizontal view, a kind of panorama, and the texts are all projected, designed vertically on the, on the billboard at the flip side. And from this, you can see from a distance, the other crater, the highest one. Here we are a few steps closer to the summit of the higher crater, the one I would call the crater of capital, the other the crater of law, and this is the cr crater of capital. A little bit closer. And there is quite a relevant detail, which is striking, which has a lot to do with the text also with the text, so here we are. When you perceive the text in the middle of this uh, business hub, you, it's immediately clear what the message is, because these columns, designed as such, look like skyscrapers. They are kind of anal anal analogical, uh, designed, analogically designed, like this. Yeah, like specific levels of one scraper. We go to the sixth one. We are about to reach the summit of the second crater. And particularly this view is quite nice or sublime, whatever you want. From this point we have a true panorama. We look into the second crater on the other side. So the crater of law, as I call it, is kind of on top of the, uh, it's lower than the crater of cat. So I go quickly now to number seven, which is on the side of the highest crater, and close to the Abbey of Amaro Pau, is just the main building at this business hub. There we go. And that's one striking thing, that's the first billboard without a kind of panorama, just it's looking up to the highest building here, the most dominant one of the whole business hub, the, the main bank. So that's, that's kind of an analogy which invites you to make this association that's like one-to-one -one combination. And then I go to the next one, number eight, and number seven. Excuse me. That's on the other side of the crater. So we we're going to slope down step by step. Let's get a view of the Abbey and Andro, just uh, the bank here, as well, from the, from the other side. And then we go slowly to the lowest level of the island. We distance ourselves as far as possible, but this is the kind of before last step. You see some green grown on the island. It's not that relevant, but the distancing is, has some kind of critical power, so you can have some kind of view on what's happening over there. 
but you are still in the island. You cannot get off the island. So the last one, uh, you have the kind of overview, sort of overview. Uh, it's more or less framing the power game in, in one frame. So let's, let's do it here. This is the last one. This is the whole business of silence. So to rephrase the whole notion of operative concept, the contour of Schertze came into existence under the influence of two forces. It is the limit or border constituted by two powers of nature. The earth unfolded its power liquidly in the magma. The earthly volcanic pressure constituted the contour from the inside, so to speak. At the same time, the oceanic power acted on the magma and enclosed and framed the magma, enveloped by the oceanic force, as it were, from the outside. The result is a volcanic contour of an oceanic island. The result is of inside and outside forces. From 1967, this contour was more or less fixed. But as the Leuze has it, and I quote him, these elements are in constant strife. These ontological features make that this contour can be called the prototype, I would say, or the archetype of the frame, the radical and absolute origin of the frame. Landfall takes up the elan that produced the frame of the oceanic island. This elan in the artistic use of the contour should be considered as the second origin of the frame. It is far more important than the first origin because, I quote the it, it gives us the law of repetition. The conceptual and imaginative repetition gives us the opportunity to understand something of the tectonic forces. The map of the Zardes shows a projection into the future at the same time that is, the map is a design of an urban plan. In order to be able to focus closer to the frame as an operative concept, some shortcuts to the classical concept of the frame are necessary. So I do a short detour of two minutes to uh, art history. Renaissance artists like Bruno Lachin, Alberti and Dürer invented and developed the frame exclusively for architectonical and painterly purposes. The frame being part and parcel of the understanding and construction of the systematic space as Panofsky said. They can be regarded as a crucial mimetic device, or it can be regarded as a crucial mimetic device of the history of art and representation. Since Panofsky's research on perspective and symbolic form, the notion of the frame is understood as an historically developed category. Panofsky emphasizes the so-called success of the specific truth value of this category of rationality and consistency. In this way, the Renaissance succeeded in mathematically fully rationalizing an image of space. It was now possible to construct an unambiguous and consistent spatial structure. In Panofsky's eyes, the modern frame not only concludes, but also completes a great evolution from aggregate space to systematic space. Deleuze has a point in saying that, for, for example, in Pollock's and Rauschenberg's work, I quote Deleuze, the surface stops being a window on the world. End of quote. Yet this specific ending in the history of art, the end of representational art, has not at all stopped perspectivism, I quote Deleuze again, that is, perspectivism as a power of arranged, arranging cases, end of quote. Neither did the frame cease to be an operative concept with an ordering or arranging power. The frame has been reflected upon as a liminal, liminal force of projection. Like the boundary of a fold, the frame is like a disclosing and at the same time enclosing envelope, the correlative of a point of view, which, is, which also enables, for instance, to establish the context of a view on the future. I saw this uh, Bart working in the Biennale in the um, um, I, I could also have had, of course, uh, Duchamp's famous uh, Le Grand Vert. But, uh, there are a lot of frames which are kind of really 
explicitly framed. So Eugène and Lacroix in the figurative painting, it, does, it doesn't really have to be a rectangular, the frame. It can be a conceptual painting. It may retain its square line shape. It just might provide a view on the white wall in this case, and even on the first frame, which it depends. The frame is nothing more and nothing less than a contour. I cite uh, Eckhart Deleuze, a virtuality that never stops defining itself. This is probably a suitable moment to take a closer look at a specific aspect of the frame of Surte, used as an operative concept in landfall. Apart from the three distinguished acts already mentioned, another act is of main importance for a full understanding of the frame as an operative concept. It is not explicitly mentioned, but very likely you have already noticed this aspect. When we compare the geographical contour to the artistic contour, both differ, differ significantly, not so much in, sh in shape, but in orientation. The contour used in landfall is turned several degrees eastward, approximately 40 degrees. This extra aspect I would call reorientation. So an interim summary shows us not three, but four significant operations. Apart from the three mentioned manipulations, the contour of Surtse is turned 40 degrees to the east. This particular operation of reorientation transforms the contour of Surtse into a frame and a blueprint for the artscape of landfall. I would call this map the blueprint of landfall. Some conclusive remarks. The particular operation suggested to effectuate the rearticulation of the identity of the Zaras, or say, a reinvention of the map people at that time had in mind of the urban construction bit. Seen through the frame of Surtse, the Zaras transformed into an island of one kind, which lead, leads to the speculative observation that in landfall not two maps and two territories are just related. But the projection of Surtse frame also reinvents the Zaytas as a particular volcanic island. Looking through the frame of Surtse, not only Surtse is recreated in the Zaytas, but the Zaytas itself is transformed and redefined as an island. Landfall invites us to reflect on the relation between both islands. I quote Deleuze, the second is just as necessary and essential as the first. But he also stipulates Deleuze, as we will remember, the second is far more important because it gives us the law of repetition. The frame functions as a form of thought, with the same critical status as, for instance, the Kantian limit concept, the constructed horizon with the positive side effect, with the positive side effect of enhancing critical understanding of the objective dynamics of capitalist power. In landfall, the imagination invents other possible views and at the same time, it questions the truth of the reality of Zaytas. The effect is more or less sort of deterritorialization. The claim is, the speculative operations of landfall suggest an invitation to project the tectonic details of Zaytas into and on the Zaytas. In short, landfall proposes to look at the Zaytas in a critical way. This specific claim is based on the conviction that landfall is the result of thorough research of the artist. In this respect, especially the reorientation of Surtse seems to serve a specific critical purpose. Let me substantiate this claim very short, a little bit more. Do I have two minutes, three minutes? A closer look brings us to the following facts. The small dot indicates the highest point of the island. It is on the edge of, edge of the first crater named Surtse. The bigger dot indicates the middle of the other, wider, lower crater named Surtundra. These two spots correspond to specific locations of the Zaytas, as I already referred to. As a result of the meticulous reorientation, the big dot has been projected on the court of law. The small dot has been projected on the Milo Plain, close to the largest Dutch bank, the ABN Amro. The two craters are projected on two sources of earthly power, the force of law and the power of capital. Given the plausibility of the intended connection between the two craters and the two locations of the Zaytas, the reoriented contour results in the following, following. I would call it an effect of critical imagination. The force of law and the force of capital are at the surface different craters, 
that they are hidden from the eye, subterraneously, interconnected. Both craters appear to indicate, so to speak, the same body politic. Landfall is about the Dutch body politic, constituted and determined by two inter interdependent sources of power. To conclude, short, I would add one question. If not from a specific crater, where does the critical power of art come from? I can formulate the beginning of an answer here. Obviously, everyone, also critical minds, need to locate craters and need to know where certain unalterable boundaries run. Secondly, it is important to know that there is no outside the frame, but neither a shield inside. Working with and manipulating frames seems to be enough, which means not inventing completely new frames, but the permanent recreation of existing frames that seems prerequisite for critical art. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the topological and the perspectival in relationship to the whole idea? Please, again. It's a short question. I have to, I have to digest the question. Could you, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the topological view yes. as the frame and the perspectival view as the image taken? Yeah. Because um, I, 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 I kind of feel there's a bit of a problematic tension there. Isn't it? A critical tension? Yeah. Well, not, that's not a critical interesting tension, a critical conceptual weakness. Okay. Well, uh, when you take the frame as the, the, as the construction, from the nations as in as an as, as yes. a systematic space. Yes. Not an aggregate space, but a systematic space. You can say that uh, photography has more or less embodied the systematic space and it's off. So that's clear for us. What they do is to deal with searching as some kind of powerful aggregate space because it has two centers or two locations and they use this frame to show us that the systematic space or the system space, as in real life in the Zuidas business zone, can be more or less deconstructed with this kind of volcanic frame. A volcanic frame which has an aggregate space, which shows us that underneath this kind of analysis of this uh, Zuidas has to do with that we perceive two specific locations of power, and not one. But underneath, they may be connected. So that's the kind of connection you can use to frames. It's to do with the relationship between the camera and the kind of lens that is used and the kind of area of vision that is used within that frame. And then the overview as a topological structure. You know, it's kind of... I don't know what that relationship is between the yeah. thing seen and the thing within the camera and the thing being pointed to from the topological viewpoint. Do you see what I mean? It seems to me that conceptually I understand it, mm -hmm. but formally I kind of think it's a little weak somehow. It's kind of it's a it's an interesting conceptual. Tell, tell me what we well, my uh, weakness. Well, by the way, I don't mind weakness, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. Okay. I mean, I would like to know yes. rather when rather from the position of where the camera is. The position that the view is taken as a as a as a, as a, as a, as a set of degrees. Do, do you see what I mean? Because we're sick with we're doing very very specific about this topological twist yes. and this overview, but not specific about the actual degree of vision at that point where the camera is being photographed from. The where the camera is searching. Searching. Where searching is photographed from. Well, the camera is. I can show you another. Um, I mean, I've shown to uh, the location, the topological, yeah. the camera is from all kinds of direction. Uh, most of the time, uh, have a view on the horizon and the kind of borders of the island, but constantly the volcanoes are in view, yeah. and they are photographed to bring them in location with the billboards. 
understand. Yeah. So um, and is dealing with the. I have this uh, slide. Um, I can show a slide. I don't, I, maybe I have, maybe it's a long no, time. Maybe, maybe, yeah, just, yeah. This, this is kind of complicated. You cannot just solve this. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Answer yeah. this question with two or three words. Yeah. There, is, there is a complicated manipulation of the contours of search, this twisted side. And then the installation, that's the recreation side, the installation of the boulevards to let the people who use this advice, to let the people feel that they are on a volcanic island. So that's the, the kind of yeah. implementation. Yeah. So all the business people, most of them, walk in and see these billboards and say, what's happening here? Why? And they can have this kind of view of reflecting on where they are. And it dislocates more or less their being there. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the, the purpose is of the, yeah. of the billboards. Yeah. Yeah. So and the, whole, the, the whole artistic conception, the operative concept is here, that they, they have a kind of research on search, say, they make their own photo, photographs and uh, proposed this kind of installation for a few years. So that was a whole a whole project. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah, this yeah, conversation. Yeah, it's so it's it's maybe we can leave it for the break afterwards. Yeah. And uh, thank you again. It's unfortunately time to move on. <laughs> but thank you.